Because when they hear these same things done all the time in the church, I don't mean evil things, but just what is routine in the worship, such as amen, then they may, at the appropriate time, cry out amen, because that's just what they're used to. It's part of them. We are influenced by what is around us. But we have this problem, and you may think, well, it's worse today than ever. Probably it's only because there's so much more, more in the way of getting it out where we can hear it. And um, so, much, so many more people. I read a thing written in 1957 to where a commentator was lamenting how terrible foul language and profanity was. And how could it get much worse? Well, that's 60 years ago. There's no doubt that in our homes and in our society in general, such foul language is all around us. And there's no doubt that God expects us to be strong enough in the faith to be able to reject all of that unless you think you can move to the moon. Paul reasoned that way about disciplining the church members. He said, I'm aiming this at the church is the way they ought to be and what you ought to do to keep them straight not talking about those out there in the world. For if you got away from them, you'd have to leave the world. So the strength of faith that ought to be in a mature Christian ought to be strong enough to withstand that which is in the world and deal with it with the Word of God as the way Christians are expected to deal with it. The fact is, it's there. It's all around us. And we must be able to deal with it. You know, one of the sad things, and I'll leave this illustration and move on further, is that you hear from Christian school teachers about children. And when they enter preschool, kindergarten, first grade, I'll use the colloquial, they can cuss a blue streak. Now, why is that? Because that's what they hear at home all the time. That's what they're exposed to all the way around. Because the home has gone the way of the Titanic, as far as the way God wants it. The scriptures speak of filthy talking in Ephesians 5, 4. Filthy speaking. According to Greek authorities, a number of them, Bayer, Danker, Arndt, Gingrich, Greek-English lexicon, and so on. The term filthy, aiskrotes entails behavior that flouts social and moral standards, shamefulness, obscenity, while shameful speech, iscrologia, Colossians 3.8, denotes speech of a kind that is generally considered in poor taste, obscene speech, dirty talk. Now remember, Colossians was writing to our brethren. Ephesians was writing to our brethren. These words are designed to say, Christians don't do that. That's not characteristic of the faith of Christians. It's not a Christian example. It has nothing to do with the name Christian, which means of Christ. But then you look at Peter in writing to Christians, 2 Peter 2.18, and he uses the word lascivious, lascivious speech. Lascivious speech is designed to conjure up illicit sexual images and ideas. How can you drive down the road almost today and not see something like that? Corrupt, that's morally unwholesome, harmful. Corrupt communication, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, is likewise condemned. Foolish talking. Literally in the Greek, it's moronic talking. It's speech that reveals a stupid mind, while jesting suggests off-color humor, Ephesians 5 and verse 4. 
Again, I stop here and simply call your own life to witness. How do you escape it in the normal operations of life? I remember one time, and you probably don't know about this history, but General Thomas Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, was a very pious man when it came to living a godly life, as the New Testament teaches, as we've been talking about here. But, of course, that's not characteristic of people in the service, even back in those days or any days. And one of his generals, in the midst of getting ready for a battle or some point in it, was using all kinds of foul language in speaking to the general not cursing the general just in the process like people do it's a part of their vernacular their vocabulary and when he finished general jackson said general so-and-so i fear you are a very wicked man well that's true out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh what we think about what we meditate on the environment we choose to be a part of influences us. You know, the environment we're around or in either influences us to do good or to do evil. Now think about it. That's all it can do when it comes to those matters. Either influencing you to do good as the Bible defines good or evil as the Bible defines evil. There's no in-between. What's confusing and upsetting to a lot of us is the fact that some professed Christians defend the use of filthy language. You, if you do much studying, and like I say, and I've told you before, I try to keep up what's out there by going a lot to the Internet and looking where you can find these things. As far as writings and new works, where I have no other way I can find out what's going on, and that's the reason the thing's there. And it certainly serves a good purpose for that point. And you find some people are actually trying to defend such things under the guise of its artistic language. And they contend that opposition to such is anti-intellectual. Does that not tell you that people want heaven but they want it on their own terms? They think they want heaven. But whatever it is, they're not going to abide by God's will and they're going to change God's will when it comes to what God says is faithful living, an aspect of it, in, in the church. There are ways that people who are determined to live like the Bible says can think through things and even make comments to folks around about you in appropriate manners. And you can't be perfect at it. Don't try to be perfect at it. You can't be. There's too much of it out there. But there's opportunities. There's opportunities you can have in saying something. I've had several of those opportunities, not in recent years. But in my first full-time local work, I wasn't married. We were in South Arkansas, and down there, the timber business is a mighty big business. And one of the members that day, the McCulloch Chainsaw, that was the big one. And he owned a McCullough dealership and was a tremendous uh, person when it came to repairing those things. And I, he lived down from my house, my house at that time. And uh, so I'd go down there once in a while and just visit with him. Well, I went down one day when all of the people from the woods were bringing in their broken chainsaws for him to fix. So there's several of them coming in. He had a personal relationship with all of them. Well, I was standing there. <coughs> And one of them came in, and I mean, he was coloring the air blue with his language. And the church member was, you know, God was there all along, but I'm the preacher, so he's nervous and looking for an opportunity to get a word in. This is the preacher. So that's the way he, he did it. He introduced me as the preacher, and the man got beer. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were a preacher, whatever. And it's just one of those opportunities that this came to mind. When he finished making all of his apologies, I said, well, remember this. It's not my ears hearing you say that that someday is going to make the difference. I will admit that I haven't always thought about those things that way, but I'm simply telling you if you think and tune yourself to it, there are times you get a chance out here in the world to make a comment that might make some people think. 
As I say, I wish I had done that all along. I remember one time after we were married at another congregation and went down to the see one of the elders who owned a used car business, and he wasn't there. But some fellow out in the parking lot was letting the hammer down and using the Lord's name in vain in the most typical way it's used. And I was fed up with it in this a little bit. So, and of course he's using it, not even realizing he's using it. That's what happens. So I said, do you pray like that very often? Which caught him completely off guard. And he had to ask me because he thought he misunderstood me. He said, what, what, I didn't understand. What did you say? I said, do you pray like that very often? And you could see he was not a praying person. And so he, he kind of backed off. And uh, he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I've been listening to you. Ask God to damn this and ask God to damn that. And I just wonder if you prayed like that to God very often. Of course, I was sitting behind the steering wheel with the car running at the time that I said that, speaking through the window. So that's what I mean by be circumspect when you choose what you say. Now, let me say again, I tell those two, and they, that I, I'm thrilled that I can tell them because I did that. I just wish I could think at times when other times there's so much going on that I can make similar responses as other times I did then. But I'm quite pleased that I thought of it. It's been a guideline to me whenever I get a chance. But let me ask you this. That's one way you're the light of the world. That's one way that you influence the world for good. You at least let people know, I don't do that. And here's what you're really doing. Again, I wish I could think that fast all the time. But that's where we are. I love thy kingdom, Lord. That's what we just say. Well, then we love the way the Lord expects citizens of the kingdom to live. The kind of lives citizens of the kingdom are to live. Then we have to be mindful of that. Now let me pause here and tell you what I did in the beginning. This is the first barrel of a double barrel sermon. Second barrel will launch this afternoon. Now if you think that's too hard, I'll say it's, it's the first in a series of two. <laughs> I'm preaching the first one now. The second will follow this afternoon. But when you see people trying to justify name themselves Christians and godly people and are trying to justify such language as is all around us, and such ra rationalization carries no weight with the genuinely spiritual person. Because that person is spiritual because he does spiritual things, and those spiritual things are written down in God's Word. Words become profane. Profane when sacred meanings are treated in a common and trivial fashion. Sometimes, if you're a student of history, you'll, you'll see the term profane history. Well, that doesn't mean somebody's cussing all throughout the thing. It doesn't mean that at all. It means it is not pertaining to God and godly things. So it's profane. So it is used in that sense to separate inspired history from that which is secular history. But when it comes to the actual profaning of something, you have used it contrary to where, it, to, in a way that it wasn't meant to be used. So when you've got the term God or Christ or anything pertaining to godliness, then it's expected to be used in a sacred manner and not some sort of light, frivolous, trivial way. One of the commands of the Ten Commandments was, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Exodus 20 and 7. Now, anywhere you want to read before the Mosaic Age in patriarchy or in the Christian Age in the New Testament, that sentiment appears. Everything you see in reference to God in the Bible, then He is high and holy and far beyond us, and we are to reverend His name. And this probably refers to an appeal, that is Exodus 27, to the Lord's name at that time in the context of some kind of oath, Leviticus 19.12, some kind of frivolous way of saying, saying it when you don't really mean it, yet it covers all these other ways to trivially use the Lord's name or anything sacred. To lie under oath, so help me God. 
or to whimsically accentuate your affirmations with, my God, is a principle, a form, in principle, is a form of profanity. You see, we have our own sometimes more narrow definition of profanity than really we should. It reaches further a lot of things than we realize, and we must realize that. In fact, just take the word. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with the letters in a word. D-O-G is dog. Change those letters around, and capital G-O-D is God. So it has nothing to do with just words. It has to do with the concept in the word. Words are signs of ideas. They are vehicles of thought. When you frivol frivolously and trivially, lightly use sacred things, then you're profaning them. So it has more to do than just the common way people uh, use God's name in vain. And of course, you see how it's used in so many ways. Now, I can't think of anything. Well, I can think of some things. But this one fits right in with the rest of it. That would make the devil happier than especially for, his own, for God's own people to be flippantly using their father's name. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And yet turn right around and exclaim, Oh my! And you hear that so much. So it's abbreviated now, OMG. And that just turns my stomach. But how far do you read? How far do you live away from things that you don't hear it? It's all around. Well, aren't we to be the leavening for good in the world? Then we can learn to say things where we can to bring some things to people's attention. Because frankly, folks, most people don't even think a thing about it. They just don't because they've come from families that do it. It's just the way things are done. They've been raised with it, as we said at the beginning of the lesson. But under the law of Moses, the name of God was certainly not to be profaned. Leviticus 18, verse 21. And the context of this verse has to do with the use of God's name in the middle of all of this This. This pagan worship, the environment of pagan worship. So the, here's what the, we want to get over. The principle, the principle involves taking the sacred name of the Lord and vulgarly transporting it into the domain of what is secular. This concept finds a manifestation in all sorts of ways that I've already mentioned. And I've seen some fine old grandmothers that do anything in the world for you and never miss church at all. And yet something surprised them to throw their apron in the air and say, oh, Lordy, mercy. And they don't think of what they're doing. They don't mean to be doing it. But therein is the problem. They're not thinking about it. Christianity is a taught religion. Christianity is a taught religion. Thus, all aspects of living the Christian life is a taught religion. So you see people... Talk about J.C., meaning Jesus Christ. Or you see G's, which is just short for Jesus Christ. All of those things. Well, why do we have to say anything? If anything, just say, ah. <laughs> ah. I don't know how many times you'd be saying that. And that might cause consternation from some people when there's so much of that kind of thing being said. And you're going, ah. You know, I hyperventilate there's so much of it going on. The Greek word, bebelu, is twice rendered profane in the New Testament. Matthew 12, 5 and Acts 24, 6. It's defined as to cause something highly revered to become identified with the commonplace. Violate sanctity. Desecrate. Profane. Surely it's not difficult to conclude that this category of irreverence, and that's what it is, irreverence, is perpetuated in all kinds of common expressions of speech today. And it hardly minimizes the transgression to, as I've already referred to one example, euphemize the use of sacred names by disguising, we think, and softening, we think, the format as in good gosh or golly and the like. An unabridged dictionary, and it's that simple, 
An unabridged dictionary will reveal the derivation of these terms to those who have sufficient interest to consider their vocabulary and what's meant. Dictionaries are wonderful things because they define terms. They give you even the history of terms. And then all of these words we use like that, how do they help anybody be more spiritual? How do they help you set a godly example? Or is it an example of a Christian being like the world? In biblical parlance, to curse, katara, is to utter a maldiction or an imprecation upon someone. You know, may the bird of paradise fly up your mows. That's the curse I'm placing on you. That, that kind of a curse is different from, quote, cussing, unquote. The term may be used legitimately of a pronouncement of divine judgment, as in Galatians 3, 10, 13, Hebrews 6, 8, a curse of God against somebody. But it's not foul language as we tend to think of cursing today. But it's not to be employed whimsically by humans. It denotes a malevolent curse uttered against another as expression of, of a personal anger and wrath and bitterness, John 3.10. 2 Peter 2 and verse 14. It finds a modern vent, if you please, in such phrases as go to or blank you. That's exactly what you're manifesting. Is your attitude of your heart toward that person and you're telling them so. Well, that's a far cry from saying boldly, you're lost in your sins and you need to listen to the truth and learn how to be saved. That's what ought to be said or something like that or anytime you can make a point. And there's nothing ever wrong if you can't say more than this to say, well, what you just said is wrong as it can be. I hope you repent and do God's will before it's too late. We don't do that much, but that's some of the things we could do in being a godly example. It's important to realize that the terms hell, or for that matter, uh, a number of terms, the term damn in itself, as it's used in the scriptures, is not inherently evil. There's a proper context in which they are permissible. Jesus spoke of that sort of purpose, who is uh, that sort of person, who he called him a child of hell. Matthew 23, 15. And in the Great Commission, he warns those who do not obey the gospel, they're not baptized in Christ, he says, they shall be damned. Mark 16, 16, King James Version. It is in the manner and purpose that such terms are employed. Hatefully, vindictively, in a pejorative fashion that makes the use of them wrong and displays a character trait of a Christian that should not be there. This is also the case with the use of the word fool. Matthew 5:22. But there's a legitimate scriptural use of the word. Compare that with a legitimate employment of this word by God. In Psalm 14, 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. My reasoning's always been this. If God can call a man a fool in a book that's teaching me, then I can call a man a fool that God calls a fool. And he said a man who's an atheist is a fool. That doesn't mean I hate him. It just means that's what he is. And that's what God said he is because of what he is. You have that also in 1 Corinthians 15, 36. And Paul even called the churches of Galatia, old foolish Galatians, Galatians 3, 1. So there's proper uses of some words. When you yank them out, that's a real scholarly word. When you yank them out of the environment where God put them in inspired writ to convey a certain thought, and then we use them like we want to, then we've abused them. Many understand the meaning of the New Testament text that records that Peter cursed and swore in connection with his denial of Christ, Mark 14, 71. This does not mean that Peter broke forth in some sort of vile and vulgar language such as we commonly hear today. Rather, the meaning of the passage is this. 
Peter was full of fear. He was in a panic. And Peter denied the Lord. He was, we would say today, scared out of his wits. And he was reinforcing his denial with a calling down of curses upon himself. If it wasn't true that he didn't know him. That's what he was doing. That's how terrible it was. You don't understand why when the Lord looked at him a little later that he went out and wept bitterly. That, comp that coupled with uh, the boast he and the other apostles had made they would never leave the Lord must have broken him down more than we can fathom. So what did, what did he do? Well, he did wrong. It was a panicky act of a terrified man. Again, appealing to history, you read about many battles. And when an army is being overrun by another army, you know what the tendency of the defeated army is to do? When people are yelling and screaming and dying all around them and they're maimed or everywhere, break and run and don't get in his way. We laugh sometimes and make a joke out of that to make a point. The fellow is so scared, you know, says, Where's the door? He said, no, no. He said, just show me a wall I'll make one. That's the evidence of the desperateness of people when they've lost all control of themselves. So that's what Peter was doing. He was calling down curses from God to say, this would come upon me if I didn't truly not know him. So we have to understand the meaning of the word curse, don't we? As the Bible uses it. The Christian must strive to keep his speech pure. And a general guideline is our speech is to edify one another. Edify is to spiritually build up. Now that may mean words of comfort in time of sorrow. It may mean like Paul was standing Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. The matter had to be corrected. It was a falsehood. It was wrong acting on Peter's part. But it had to do with the truth and what God says of the truth that is to be characteristically a part of every Christian. So we all must refrain from the vulgar, the irreverent, and the reviling abuse of language that is unbecoming to a person who seeks to emulate Christ in the thought, words, and actions. I don't know how many of you have traveled overseas some places in some countries and environments, social environments, it's worse than others. But nakedness and depictions of erotic things are in a lot of places just as common as you see some of these advertising signs up and down the street. And the people there are, who become Christians have to deal with that. Well, we don't have it here in the same way. I say the same way. We have it here through the internet, still through books, magazines, still through people talking to one another, certainly at the movies, and all sorts of things. So we have to be honestly examining ourselves to see whether we're encouraging that kind of thing, whether we're a part of it, or whether we're opposing it. Now, it ought to be understood clearly that you can't go out of this world, as I said a while ago, to escape it. Well, since we go, can't go outside of this world to escape it, it's all around us, on the job, in the school, a lot of times in family gatherings, and so forth. What should we do? Well, I've already given you some examples. Sometimes, get up, walk away. It's one of the best things you can do. That really causes people to scratch their head. And if they ask why, I just didn't like the language I was hearing. I don't use it. I read an article not long ago that says we need mamas to come back with the soap so they can wash the mouths out of their children. Well, I must say that's probably true in the reason that they did that at one time. But I think I will invest in the soap stocks if they do because there's going to be a great need of it. So what are we to do? We're first of all not to use it. Next of all, quit trying to defend it. Thirdly, actually rebuke it. May open my door to study the Bible with somebody. 
Folks, listen. Some people simply do not know any better. Don't judge them on the basis of what you know. And in trying to take the gospel to the world, if you don't understand that, you're going to miss a lot of things. When you read the book of Acts, you see Paul taking people where they were in their knowledge and then bringing them from there to a saving knowledge of the truth. And he didn't begin at the same place every time. Yet he ended up at the same place every time. The gospel of Christ and the truth about being saved from your sins. Someday we'll have to stand before the Lord to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad, and that's going to cover what we talked about this morning. Idle words we will we'll give an account of, Jesus said. So let us labor to make our words edify, build up spiritually. And when we get a chance, do all we can to get people to see what they really sound like, call their attention to it. I've had a few opportunities to do that, and if they avail themselves again, then I'll try to do it again, because that's kind of, I kind of keep tuned in to that radio station so that I'll be ready, but I don't always get that chance. So what are you going to do? Well, I think we have to answer that. We already have without speaking out. But I close the lesson by saying again, we want to deal more with another prong of it this afternoon. But at this time, if you're not a Christian, we urge you with all your heart to believe that Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sin, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism, to live that righteous, godly life in the church to which He will add you, being faithful to Him. If as a child of God you haven't been faithful, then repent of those particular sins. You know them. A lot of these things we talked about in detail today, you would know what we're talking about anyway. So if you've committed sin, repent of them. Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. And if you need to obey the truth now, we invite you to do so while we stand and while we